everyone. Welcome to Everyday Champions Live. My name is Beck, and we are a global family online serving local people in the name of Jesus. Now, I've come down to a local coffee shop here near to where I live because I had a conversation this week and this person came to me and said, Beck, I want to be better. I want to get better and I need some coaching. And I am meeting this person shortly today, but I just thought, how great is that? That they recognized that they needed to be better. Their life wasn't falling apart, but they just wanted to be better. And they knew that coaching and discipleship was the way to go about it. So I'm meeting this person. So I encourage you, maybe you're sitting there thinking, do you know what? I need to be better. I need to get better in my life, in my work, in whatever kind of area that in your life that you want to focus on or in this, even in the sphere and within your work that you are kind of operating in. It is great to get a coach. So I really encourage you to have a conversation this week. Make an appointment with someone and say, hey, will you help me? Will you coach me? as you can get better as we live for Jesus. So I'm going to kind of get into a conversation shortly and we're going to go over to a conversation with Gareth and Leanne who again are working and helping us in our discipleship. So I encourage you to get your notepads ready and some devices ready to take some notes uh, and share it with someone this week. So let's jump over to the conversation. Welcome to Everyday Champions and another conversation as we continue to work through the gears, the winning gears of momentum. And in the last session, we talked about sharing the plan, being accountable and the importance of that, how it keeps us active, it keeps us engaged, it keeps us sharp and connected and the importance of that. And of course, so we've slipped from that gear into the next gear, gear number four. 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 There you go. I nearly said five. Four. <laughs> this is where we're really picking up momentum now. You know, when you get into fourth gear, you feel like you can relax. Like first gear, second gear, third gear, you feel like you're still picking up speed. But gear four, you feel like you're really gaining momentum. But it's not the time to stop. It's the time to just keep going because otherwise you have to go back to gear one and start again. And gear four, we're talking about resourcing the plan. So we've, we've made a plan, we've shared it, but now we're going to resource it. Yeah, and it's the shift from having a conversation to taking action. Mm, So like you said, Leanne, you know, we've had the immersion of gear one, the making a plan of gear two, sharing the plan, involving other voices in gear three. But now it's about how do we take all the resource that we currently have and, and enable the plan to come to life yeah. you know and it's about the process of of counting the cost mm. and asking the question okay if this is what this plan is going to cost to deliver this outcome the question we then have to ask is am i willing to pay it yeah. because it's nice to have the idea but to pay the price to pay the bill that's yep. going to deliver that well that's another thing mm. And I'm sure there's lots of things that we can think about in our lives where we've launched out on this thing, this idea, this vision, this plan, whatever, but actually we haven't fully counted the cost. We haven't fully looked at what it's really going to take. And that's when we stop because we realize, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't going to work. We've done it lots of times. You know, you get a great idea. Oh, I know. Even as something as small as like, oh, next week we could go there and do that. And then you start to look at actually, okay, it's going to cost us this amount in petrol, this amount in time, we're going to have to do this, take this. And you suddenly go, nah, can't be bothered. <laughs> yeah, it's like the the wind goes out of your sails, doesn't yeah, it? Literally. You have that enthusiasm and like, oh yeah, this is going to be amazing. But then, oh, 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 oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when in that process of counting the cost, it really highlights whether the thing that you were going to do carries any value That's anyway. True. So if you go, oh, it doesn't matter what it costs, I'm going to do it, I'm going to achieve it, or I'm going to go there or whatever, then you know you're probably on the right track. If when you start to count the cost, you go, actually, nah, can't be bothered. You know, you realize that idea was a flash in the pan. It wasn't really a great 
idea. It wasn't really something you're willing to throw time, money, effort and energy into. And so maybe this is a good point for us to open on our first interaction yes, question. And we want to ask you, have you ever started something or launched out on an idea and not really counted the cost beforehand? We want to know what happened. <laughs> we want to know all of the, all those disasters that have happened. So make sure you talk about that with each other. If you're by yourself, just have a think, maybe jot some things into the chat so we can share with you. But take a few moments and then we will be back. Okay, maybe some of you have shared some lighthearted plans that you kind of bailed on because you hadn't counted the cost. Or maybe some of you have shared some bigger plans and ideas that didn't work out due to that lack of counting the cost, lack of resourcing the plan. The sad thing is that in life and in our discipleship journey with Jesus, very often we can pull out of some of the things and backtrack and give up uh, some of the goals that we've had simply because we didn't count the cost simply because we had an idea in our head we thought it was going to be easy and perhaps we didn't value it enough to resource it particularly and that's quite a sad thing and I know some people that have even dropped out of the whole discipleship process completely and turned their back on God because they didn't realize it's going to cost them so much. Mm. And yet Jesus laid it out quite clearly that we were to carry, pick up our cross and carry it and follow him. That actually this was going to be a costly journey. And it's the process or counting the cost of the process of separating good ideas from God ideas. Yeah, good. And you know, I remember being at Bible college and uh, in the first year, there was the option to learn Greek, in other words, to learn the Hebrew, uh, sorry, to, to learn the, the Bible in its original 
language. Yeah. Of course, the Old Testament was Hebrew, the New Testament was Greek and Ara Aramaic. So to kind of learn the New Testament original language, and I, I thought, oh, this sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> and they would often warn, but it's going to take you a lot of time, and sometimes it's not going to make feel like you're making much progress. And and bearing in mind, you know, I was never good at any languages anyway, but I thought, well, it was a dead language, so that's a bit different, and it's an ancient <laughs> language, so maybe I could do it. And I did it for one term, but it was definitely a good idea rather than something I had a deep <laughs> conviction about because the amount of effort and energy it, it, it took to, to do it was, was significant. I still remember some things, so it wasn't a complete waste of time. <laughs> but I think, you know, counting the cost really helps us to to separate that conviction yeah. from from just you know an idea yes. a, a good idea from a a god idea and that's why it's so important to do it up front yeah because we can waste and maybe we have you know i'm sure we all have to some degree but wasted a, a time effort and resource because we haven't gone through the rigorous process of counting the cost up front yeah. and then feeling those emotions of oh yeah but yeah but and in that moment when that yeah but comes in mm. if there isn't a deeper yes but we must i must i should i have to then it's probably just a good idea and jesus knew the message of the kingdom sounded good yeah. You know, it sounded good, and and he, but he knew that there was a cost to it, and he wanted people. He was he, and this is what I love about Jesus. I mean, there's many things I love about <laughs> Jesus, but he loved people so much that he didn't want them to go on a journey that they couldn't sustain. Yeah, he wanted them to count the cost up front. Yeah, because there would be a greater cost yeah. to them dropping out, and also he needed to protect, in one sense, the and this comes back to what we shared last week the quality of accountability because yeah. that group had to all be on the same page if you've got people who actually it's just a good idea and to some people no this is a god thing then that can really dilute that group so i think jesus teaches us such an important principle here and it's out of his love for us that he wants us to count the cost and we're going to read about one of those occasions mm. in a second because really the the whole point of getting to to realize the plan realize the goal is going to take preparation yep dedication and sacrifice because it will literally test us whether what that that thing is whether yes. it is really worth it whether, whether we really place value on it and of course if it's simply being a disciple of jesus christ jesus is 100 percent worth following but we have to decide are we willing to back everything else up um, and line it up to to back that decision and in in luke 14 we read here that jesus was talking to a large crowd and and i'm going to read the verses in a moment but show us exactly how really <laughs> if this was a marketing strategy <laughs> by jesus in terms of today they'd be going jesus what are you doing <laughs> because he was getting narrowing it right down to the few that were going to really count the cost and then pay it and in luke 14 verse 25 we read this Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule, ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't be able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You know, this is the crux of it here. It's the cost. It's the effort, the sacrifice, the loss, in a sense, necessary to achieve or obtain something. And Jesus lays it out perfectly clear. And I don't think it's incidental or coincidental that right at the very start there, it says large crowds were following him. You see, when there's a large crowd, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we'll follow you. Yeah, this sounds great. 
But then when Jesus starts to outline what it's actually going to cost, we know that not everybody would have followed on that journey. And right at the start, we have to say here that the question is, do you really want it? Yeah. That's the first thing we're going to ask is, do you really want it? Because if the desire is not there, we will never count the cost appropriately. And Jesus was basically saying, do you really want me? Hmm. Do you really want it? Because if you do, this is what it's going to cost. Yeah, and that's what passion is, isn't it? It's yeah. a passion is a willingness to suffer and passion is the distinguishing between love and hate. Yeah. Uh, you know, half-heartedness and complacency sit somewhere in the middle. It's when we lack that distinction. But when Jesus, for instance, just at the start of that passage that you read, talks about, you know, if anyone comes to me and does not hate. Mm. Of course, Jesus is not saying go and hate your father and mother because yeah. when we interpret scripture you have to use the wider scripture yeah. as part of that process and so clearly jesus would if you took that literally you know as in as a command to go and hate then it would be in direct contradiction to you know honor your father and mother yes. what he's saying here though and and you again can go to another scripture the apostle paul talks about considering everything a loss compared yeah. to yes um, knowing Christ Jesus. And there are paraphrased versions that really emphasize the strength of that mm. um, com uh, kind of considering it loss to the point of literally considering it as animal yeah. waste. Yeah. It, it, what that distinction is, is are you willing to love me to the extreme mm. that your priorities are, are, are seen as unreasonable in yeah. the eyes of the world? So it's really important to kind of clarify that. And you're absolutely right that, you know, Jesus ministered to crowd, but he also was suspicious of crowds. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a, a thing that people do, isn't there, with crowds, crowd surfing. Yeah. You know, people jump from the stage and they get carried um, unless people move out of the way <laughs> and they fall flat on their face. But crowd surfing, uh, surfing and the whole idea is you get carried by the yeah. crowd. And, and, and to some degree uh, if in life... If we don't carry a healthy suspicion of crowds, you know, it's so easy with popular opinion, mm. with con common consensus to go with the crowds. Yeah. We really must be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. We need to, to be suspicious of crowds because we are not called to crowd surf. In mm. other words, to be carried by the crowd. We are called to, to impact the crowd. Yeah. And to impact the crowd, you have to be set apart from yeah. the crowd. And and you can only be set apart from the crowd if you have a different value system and priority system that is going to lead that crowd and to impact that crowd. And that's what Jesus was was teaching his disciples, that, that you have got to think differently in the kingdom. Yeah. Your value system, your priority system is, is at a completely different level to the world, it's unreasonable. To the world, it's upside down, it's backward. But actually, it is the right way up. And this process is not a one-off process of counting the cost. Yeah. It, is, it needs to be a built-in regular process, which of course is why we put it as a gear. Because the gears, you constantly go through the gears to build momentum. And resourcing the plan is about saying, you know, am I willing to take, let's use a very practical thing, uh, am I willing to take money that I could go and spend on pleasure here and put it behind the goal and the plan what, that God has given to me? Mm. And in the moment, I'm going to feel the, the loss of that pleasure. But actually, I have to do this. Yeah. And, and it's, it's when the rubber hits the road, isn't it? Yeah. And the, you, we can have that crowd mentality where we just rely on being part of something to carry us along but I can guarantee that when it's our own personal mission and plan just being part of that crowd will not be enough because when we do hit the problems or the the you know the bumps in the road or whatever or the cost <laughs> that crowd can't carry us and they won't and pay won't, and they won't pay it for you the only person that's ever paid anything for us is Christ when he died on the cross, he's already, he counted the cost. He knew what it was going to cost. Absolutely. To bring salvation to us. And he still paid it 
over and over and over again for for all of us whether we chose to accept it or not but the people around you the, the people who love you the most even the people you're accountable to cannot carry yeah. you or pay the cost for you or for me and jesus wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions. Jesus wasn't afraid to say stuff that might put people off because he didn't want to miss sell. And obviously I'm not talking about selling something, but in that, in that kind of terminology, something that we would turn around and then go, but you never said it was going to be this hard. Jesus laid it out. It's going to be hard. If we're going to follow Christ, we need to follow him in his death and in his resurrection, which means being willing to go through whatever to achieve the glory that, that he had when he rose from the dead. So we can't just sit back and expect to just kind of, that's it now, it's all done. The, the hardest thing was done through Jesus. And in John 6, we read that this is after Jesus been talking about himself as the bread of life and people did not understand when he talked about eating of his flesh. They were like, what are you talking about? It says there in verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching who can accept it. Now, let's just look at that for a second. This wasn't the crowds now. This was now people who'd chosen to follow him and Jesus had chosen in turn. They said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then it goes on to say, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. That is a that Jesus wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions. I'd be there going, oh, don't leave. Don't worry. It's going to get better. I promise you. Just stay, you know, or try and convince them or throw some freebies to try and keep yeah. them on board. Jesus went to the 12 that were left. Do you want to go as well? They've left. Do you, do you want to go too? Because what he wasn't doing was saying, oh, things are going to be okay or it's all rosy or don't worry. He was laying it out. They haven't counted the cost. Now it's time for you to do it. And the question we need, really need to ask ourselves is this, do we really want the journey? Do we really want this enough? Because if we do, we will put everything behind it. We will put our money. We will put our time. We will set our relationships right. We'll set our, our calendar correctly. Yeah. We will put everything to back up this journey that we're on, both kind of the, the inevitable journey of discipleship, but also the plans that we make along the way. But we have to ask ourselves, do we really have the desire? And you mentioned there that Jesus himself counted the cost. And Revelation tells us that, that Christ was the lamb slain mm. before the foundation of the earth. In other words, God created the salvation plan. He created mankind with the will to choose him or reject him. Yeah. And in that cost exercise, if yeah. I could put it that way, he recognized I need to have a plan in place should mankind choose to go their own way. Yeah. And what's that going to cost me? And of mm. course, we know it would cost him everything, yes. his, his very son, Jesus. Yeah. And so that's, again, that process reveals when, when we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he'd already gone through the process of realizing what it's going to cost me if and when they choose to turn their backs on me. Yeah. So cost exercise is, again, another question. Have I done a cost exercise is the second question that almost helps me answer the first question, yeah. which is, do I really do want, I want it? it? It's the means yeah. by which I can really challenge and test myself. And, and like you said there, Leanne, Jesus, what you choose to measure progress by is so important. You know, Jesus was not measuring progress based upon the amount of people that were following him. Mm. If he was, then he'd have been reticent to challenge those people that you mentioned in John 6, you know, to you know, go, go their own way, you know, because they're not going to pay the cost. Jesus' metric, his measurement of, of success in that sense was, you know, you, your love for one another. In other words, are we compatible? Is there a love and a passion for the kingdom, for, for one another, that prioritizes it above everything else? And again, that's what I love about Jesus. He was not swayed by the, the measurements of success that the world had. And it's so easy for us as people who are Christians and even church leaders to be swayed by yeah. those measurements of success. But this is why 
and again, as everyday champions, this is why we, we're on this route that we're on, is that our measurement of success is about growth in people. It's about them going on a journey of unlocking what God has put in them because whilst in the short term that may not give the those measurements of success that the world would say oh that's success but actually in the long term it is going to help change the world yeah and so this is a good point now to ask you the question about counting the cost when you think about counting the cost what does this mean for you according to the plans that you're currently working on or you're thinking about and Think about the total cost. Think about finance things, relationship things. There might be physical or emotion, different emotional things that you have to think about. But when you think about counting the cost, what does this mean for you? And maybe right now it's pushing on something particularly in your life that you think, yes, I know I need to, to sort that out. So maybe be vulnerable with the people around you. If you're by yourself, again, do this as a little bit of an exercise. Write some things down and we will be back in a few moments.
Okay, hopefully you were able to answer that question effectively. Maybe right now you just want to take a deep breath and relax. You know, this is can be an intense moment when we're looking at these things, but they're necessary for the journey. Absolutely. And everything that we talk about is to help and to resource you and to help you. And so although it can feel quite involved and quite intense, we want you to enjoy this process because counting the cost when you want something is actually really exciting. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you sit down and make a plan for your future about a home or a holiday or, you know, something quite simple, it becomes an enjoyable process when you really want the thing. And that's obviously going back to the first point. If you don't really want it, yeah. then it won't be an enjoyable process. But when you really desire it, when you really desire Jesus, it's exciting yeah. to count the cost. And, and I'm glad you said that. Um, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I'm glad you said that because you, when you start counting the cost, the reality yeah. of what you're bleeding for starts to kick in. And that's why this isn't a negative message. No. It's, it's sometimes counting the cost. Oh, yeah. oh, the cost. No, it's about bringing it alive, bringing the future alive now. And yeah, so that just kind of struck me just when you said that, Leanne. It is, it becomes alive, it becomes real, it is exciting. It reminds me of perhaps, you know, when you've really wanted to achieve something, you know, that you need to purchase or put money towards, you know, whether that's like a home or something like that. And you don't resent putting your money behind that or sacrificing going out for that thing because it's the joy set before you yeah. Jesus had the joy set before him which was us we should have the joy of following him and seeing you know impact in our lives set before Absolutely. us that we're willing to endure whatever Jesus endured the cross the ultimate but we should be willing to endure to pay whatever and in Luke 14 that that verse 28 suppose one of you wants which is talking about desire to build a tower won't you first sit down and estimate the cost we have to be willing to take time sit down don't just do it off you know off the top of your head sit down in accountability like we talked about in the last session and count the cost but then that kind of the final question that, that comes out of this is, do then our commitments, do your commitments match your convictions? Mm. In other words, the things that you've committed yourself to, do they match the cost that you're willing to pay? Because I think commitment and conviction are two different things. Conviction is what we know is the right thing to do. Commitment is something that we've set us, ourselves to do, but it doesn't necessarily always match what should be done. And we have to look at our daily decisions, our daily commitments, our daily actions. Do they match what I've now said I need to do? And that is another difficult question for us to ask ourselves. It is a difficult uh, question to ask, uh, ask in terms of it being challenging, but it's a simple process to yeah. immediately start to get an answer. And, you know, when you think about commitments financially, you know, uh, immediately if I was sat there coaching you, I'd be asking, okay, what are your financial commitments? Yeah. And the way you would find that out is go and have a look at your standing orders, yes. look at your direct debits, mm -hmm. look at your commitments. Those are your financial yeah. commitments that yeah. you have uh, put your name to you've signed off on and so it's asking the question okay d d do do i see evidence that i want this future in those commitments yeah, good. if not what do i start to do to change mm. those things i might not be able to change it all immediately uh there's usually and that, let me just kind of put a caveat there very often at first we think there's some things that we can't change that actually we can yeah but the pain of the change yeah. makes us think oh, oh i can't i can't change that yet yes. we'll, we'll we'll kick the can down the road on that but also relational commitments go and look at your diary when was the last time i spent time with this person or yeah. how much quality time have i spent with them and again checking our diary reveals our commitments yeah and our relational commitments and how much time have I spent on this activity? And yep. if I keep spending that much time on this activity, five years from now, will I achieve what the plan says I need to have achieved? So it's a challenging question to answer, but actually a simple process by which to get some quick and immediate insight mm. as to do I really want it by carrying out that cost exercise? And it's a question of saying, you know, to myself, is there a disconnect between my daily activities and my deepest desires? Because yep. the two can not be connected. 100%. Because we, there's still a discipline that we have to put in. You know, if somebody's sitting around going, oh, I don't know what my purpose is, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, or I think it's this, but then 
just sitting around for hours on on social media or whatever, not actually doing something. Sometimes there's a point of getting up, getting dressed, going to do something, making, you know, something of the day or the time that you have, whatever. Because if my deepest desire is to do that thing, then I will put everything else yes. in behind it. But we need to act to my daily commitments, to my daily activities. Is there a disconnect between them and my deepest desires? And Paul even talks about, you know, the struggle that goes on in himself. We, we can read it in Romans 7. You know, I, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Or do want to do, I don't end up doing. It's a, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> you know, the, he talks about... Um, the, the principle of life, I, I when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. And of course, that we wrestle with that every day. You know, so many times I think, oh, I want to be fit. So tomorrow I'm going to go for a run. Tomorrow comes, I don't do it. It's because there's a disconnect between my daily disciplines and my deepest desires. I have to get the two in line. And I'm, you know, I'm subject to that. We, we all kind we of all fall, fall yeah. short of, of our own um, convictions of what we want to do. But we have to fight ourselves. I've actually written here, we have to fight the inclinations of our human nature to follow the integrity that comes from our spirit. And that for me is a kind of something that I'm going to write somewhere that I'm going to fight the inclinations of my human nature so that I can follow the integrity of my spirit because my spirit is what is connected to God. And that's how I can make sure that everything falls into line. Yeah, that's so good. And, you know, in that passage you mentioned from Romans 7 and 8, which have been two pivotal chapters for me over the, the, the last kind of decade and a half, really, because the Apostle Paul being very open about that internal battle, it's a, yeah. it's a civil war that takes place inside of a person between the old nature and the new nature. And in verse 23 of, that, of Romans 7, he says, but there is another power yeah. within me yeah. that is at war with my mind. Mm. The message version, I believe, puts it, there are parts of me that covertly rebel. Mm -hmm. In other words, when something is covert, they're going Under, undercover yeah. and and trying to go in the opposite direction. Yeah. They're almost trying to... Have you ever been in a situation or a conversation when... Uh, it, it feels like somebody's trying to sabotage the plans <laughs> of the group, yeah. you know, uh, and they may not be obvious about it, but they're almost coming up with reasons why something can't happen. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, do, do you want this or yeah, not? Yeah. You know, and there's a difference between, you know, counting the cost and actually sowing seeds of doubt and kind of covertly rebelling. And Paul here is saying that there is this, this, this civil war that takes place and the mm -hmm. only way that you deal with it again this is where the the cross and the resurrection comes in is by by dying yeah. to that part yeah. surrendering that part paul says i die every day in other words there's parts of me i have to kill off there has to be a funeral every single day of those inclinations yeah. that you talked about leanne those feelings that are so strong at times and so potent but that's where we we need the power of the resurrection because it's only that power that is going to overrule those parts that are covertly rebelling. We need the spirit to lead us, the spirit and the integrity, as you've put it, uh, of the spirit to overrule the inclinations of the soul. Yeah, that's really good. And perhaps this is a good point now for you to go and discuss why do our commitments, our daily activities and actions sometimes not match mm. our convictions? And we need to be honest about your own barriers here because we could come up with like generic answers as to why, you know, the, those things happen. But we want you to think specifically to you. Why do sometimes we have deepest desires, but our daily actions don't necessarily match up? Again, we're going to give you a few moments and then we'll come back to finish.
okay, hopefully you were honest in that discussion about what barriers you have in the way of stopping doing the things that you know you should be doing according to the plans that you have. And, you know, we all have those. I have them. There's no point just being aware of the barrier and not doing something about it. We have to be careful to bring down those barriers, smash down those barriers daily, make new habits so that they are in line with the desires of our hearts and our spirit. But, you know, we have to make sure that everything we do is from a place of being all in. Mm. If we're going to resource this plan that we have, if we're going to really give our discipleship journey everything, if we're going to count the cost and pay it, we need to say, yes, I'm all in. Those kind of famous words that people are using a lot in in today's society, I'm all in, meaning, yeah, I'm going to give everything to, I'm going to throw everything I've got at this, just as Jesus did for us. You know, but sometimes I think when we do look at counting the cost and how much it's going to cost us it's easy for us to look for alternative routes it's easy for us to cut corners it's easy for us to choose cheaper options but let me just say this Jesus didn't cut corners for you he didn't choose a cheaper option for you and for me so in return we're going to give him our absolute best because if this is about impacting the world for him and for his kingdom we've got to make sure that we throw everything at it that we say God I seek you first in your kingdom and everything else will be added everything else is a bonus I have to look at my time my money my relationships my resources they are only there because God has given them to me so if I put them back in their rightful place I know that God is going to bring impact yeah and and the just in kind of closing it's important to remember that when we do that cost exercise it's not that you necessarily have to have everything in place to be able to complete the plan Mm. it's that's not what we're saying because we know feeding of the five thousand, for example you know the plan was we need to feed this crowd potentially thirteen thousand people the resource they had was five loaves and two fish so the resource didn't match the outcome they were believing yeah. for, but they counted yes. what they had, five loaves and two fish. And then they answered the question, do we still believe? Yeah. And that's the thing. You, it's not about waiting for everything to come in and for everything to be ready. My word, if we'd have acted <laughs> on that, we, we, we certainly wouldn't be doing what we're doing now and yeah. where we are right now. But it's about you know, going through that process. Again, all of this is about a faith process. It's yes. getting us to, to believe that the God of the unseen who has called us in the first place to deliver yeah. on this plan is able to resource it. What stands in the way is our trust and our willingness to rest in the knowledge mm. that he is working this with us. And when we walk with him and work with him, we will yes. win with him. Yeah. So come on, let's pray right now father we thank you that we can journey this with you you are about the journey forgive us for the times when we become so enamored with the outcome and the destination that we lose sight that this is all about walking with you yeah and working with you and and we 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 miss out on so much because we're so focused on outcomes but you are focused on the process and we thank you that this whole conversation about resourcing the plan and our previous conversations about sharing the plan and and making the plan are all about intimacy with you being immersed in your presence in that constant conversation that keeps us aligned to seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness with the absolute knowledge that everything else will be added. So, Father, we thank you that we can offer up our plans right now Mm. as part of our sacrifice. Father God, we thank you that it is worship to you, and we want it to be pleasing to you. And we know that when we are people who worship you in spirit and in truth, that you are pleased. And that's our heart's desire. Father, we thank you, we honour you, and we are excited to hear and to share stories of progress, of plans that are put into action, where our commitments are aligned to that plan, and we start to see the miraculous break forth and break out for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, listen, remember today and every day, you are a champion, and there's more in you than you think. Till next time, take care. See you next time.
Thank you, Gareth and Leanne, for that conversation. It is so important that we get into gear and uh, resource the plan, um, as has just been talked about. So thank you for that. Share this conversation with someone this week. And like I said earlier, get into a conversation, a coaching conversation with someone this week. We've got circles starting back. And so it's a great place to share it there also. Well, as part of our worship, we're going to take communion together, grab some bread and some juice and those people who are around you and just take a moment to thank Jesus for what he's done for you and share communion together and give him your worship. And also part of us, our worship, we like to give financially. You can head over to our website, everydaychampions.tv slash give, where you can give on a regular donation or a one-off. All the information you need is over on the website. Well, it's been great to be with you today. I hope that you have enjoyed this broadcast. Like I said, share it with someone this week. And remember today and every day, you are a champion and there is more in you than you think.